over the first two weeks, uh, we have introduced a model of evaluation of programs based on term rewriting. That was the so-called substitution model. So it's a fair question to ask whether when we have now these new concepts, uh, classes and methods and self-references, whether these concepts can be ported to our evaluation model, whether, whether it can be extended to cover these as well. In this session, you're going to find out how this is done. So far, we've only developed this model for pure functions. We have uh, de defined the meaning of a function application using a model based on substitutions. And now we extend this model to classes and objects. The first question we, we need to ask is, how is an instantiation of a class like new C with some argument expressions evaluated? The answer is surprisingly simple. We will evaluate the expression arguments e1 to em, just like the arguments of a normal function. And that's it. In fact, the resulting expression, new c of some values v1 to vm, is already a value. So we just take these new instance creation expressions as values. Next question. Let's suppose we have a class definition, like the one you see here, where we have a class c with a method f, and the formal parameters of the class are named x1 to xm, and the method f has parameters y1 to yn. Uh, the function parameters or the class parameters can lists can both be empty, and for simplicity we have omitted any parameter types. Now the central question is, if we have a expression like that, we have a uh, class instance new c of v1 to vm, then we call the method f and pass it further arguments values w1 to wn, how is that evaluated? Let's see how we would answer these questions. So as a reminder, we would have the class C, and that has the x parameters. And then it has a function f, and that would have the y parameters, and a body b. If you have an expression like this one here, then it is rewritten not using one substitution, as for plane functions, but three substitutions. The first substitution is the one we have seen before. We would have to replace the actual, the formal arg parameters of the function f with the actual argument uh, values w1 to wn. So that's that substitution that you see here. The next substitution affects the class. So we have formal parameters of the class, these also have to be replaced by the actual argument values that we have here when we create the class. So that gives us the second substitution. The th third substitution is important because the body of the function f here could contain a reference to this, the current class itself. And of course, that reference to this outside of the class wouldn't have any meaning, so we have to replace it with something else. What do we replace it with? Well, the idea is simply the receiver of this call, so the value new c v1 to vw itself. So that's the object that takes the method call, and so that's the object that replaces this. So you see there are three substitutions at play. It's quite a bit more complicated than in the purely functional model, but it's still the same model. So we can uh, model uh, evaluation with exactly the same mechanisms as before. So let's demonstrate that with an example. We're looking at the method called new rational 12numer As a reminder, I've put up the essential parts of class rational here. So let's see what happens for this method call here. I put up the formal definition. We have three substitutions at play. There's a substitution for the class parameters where the actual values 1, 2 replace the x and the y. For the method, in this case, there's nothing to replace because NUMA doesn't have any parameters. And finally, any occurrence of this would have to be replaced by the object itself so that it would be new rational 1, 2. In this case, it turns out that the right-hand side of NUMA is very simple. It's just x. So the only piece of the substitution that applies is the leftmost one here, 1 for x, and the result is 1. Let's do a more complicated example. 
Let's see whether new rational of 1, 2 is less than new rational of 2, 3. How would we go about that? So here you see the definition of less. So we would have three substitutions again. Uh, there's the substitution of 1 and 2 for x and y as before. Then there's the de substitution of the argument here, new rational of 2, 3, for the that parameter of less. And finally, there's the substitution that replaces the this and less's body by the receiver of the call, new rational of 1, 2. And all these three substitutions are applied to the body of less that you see here. So here it's written out in slightly nicer fonts. That's the body that you see here. Note that I have made explicit that this as the argument for references because we need that for the substitution model to work correctly. So what that means is that if I apply the substitutions, then the this gets replaced by new rational 1, 2. So you s that's the two occurrences you see here. And the that gets replaced by new rational 2, 3. That's the two occurrences that you see here. And if we then apply the further substitutions for number and an analogous substitution for denom, then we arrive at this expression here, which reduces to true as usual. So one more thing we want to cover this session is operators. You see, in principle, the rational numbers defined by our class are as natural as integers. They're mathematical abstractions just as good as integers. But for the user of these abstractions, there's currently a noticeable difference. You write, if x and y are integers, you write x plus y. But if r and s are rational numbers, you need to write r dot add s. So that's not very natural. And in fact, in Scala, we can eliminate this difference. To do that, we proceed in two steps. As a first step, we introduce infix notation for methods. It turns out that any method with a parameter can be used like an infix operator in Scala. So instead of r having to write r dot add s, you can write just as well r add s. r dot less s becomes r less s, and for maximum it's the same thing. So the two things mean exactly the same things. The left sides expand to the right sides. You can do that for any operator that you have in Scala. The second step is about relaxing the form of identifiers. Normally in programming languages, identifiers are alphanumeric. So they start with a letter, then they f are followed by a sequence of letters or numbers. In Scala, you have an alternative form of identifiers where identifiers can be symbolic. They start with an operator symbol, such as plus or minus, anything other letter or a digit, and they're followed by other operator symbols. In this treatment, the underscore character underscore that we use a relaxed notion of identifiers in Scala. Normally, in programming languages, an identifier is alphanumeric. It starts with a letter and it's followed by a sequence of letters and numbers. In Scala, operators are also treated as identifiers. And to achieve that, we have introduced a second form of identifiers, which we call symbolic. Such an identifier starts with an operator symbol, such as plus or minus or question mark, and is be followed by other operator symbols. In that definition, the underscore character, as usual, counts as a letter. And as a final twist, we can also mix alphanumeric and symbolic. We can start with an alphanumeric identifier, followed by an underscore, then followed by some operator symbols. So here I give you some identifiers in Scala x1 times plus question mark percent ampersand. That's not necessarily an identifier I would recommend you use. Vector underscore plus plus or counter underscore equals. And all these names are legal identifiers in Scala. So let's see how we could apply that to class rational. Let's start with the first operator less here. So a better name for less would be just the less than or equal sign. Uh, then we would change max accordingly. 
to say if this less than that and the program here compiles again. In the usage, of course, it would be the same thing. I would write x less than y. For maximum, I think maximum is a nice operator as it stands, but I can write it in fix. Now that we've dealt with less and max, uh, what about add and sub? So for add, we would of course find plus. For sub, we would uh, find minus. And the definition of sub would be this plus that dot neg. And in the code here, I can now use the arithmetic operations as I'm used from mathematics. Now the final operations to look at would be neg. We've seen that we can replace all the arithmetic operations on rational by their natural mathematical symbols, but there's still neg which uh, sort of sticks out because instead of neg maybe we would want to write prefix minus. So how can we achieve that? So if we look at the error message here, it tells us value unary underscore minus is not a member of rational. So what that means is that because the prefix operator minus is really different from the infix operator minus, there's a special convention in Scala, we have to call it unary minus. And if we do that, then we see that uh, now everything works out and we also get prefix operators. One thing to guard against uh, is that if an if a method name ends in an operator symbol, then you need at least a space between that and the final colon. Because otherwise, a colon is actually a legal uh, symbol, um, so this, the colon would just be merged with the operator name to form one long operator uh, minus colon. So that would be here an error that you see here. So you've seen that we can now use the usual mathematical expressions like x times x plus y times y. But there's one issue still, namely about the precedence of the operators. As you use, the times here binds stronger than the plus, so implicit parents go like this. But you might ask, well, how is that actually achieved if all operators are user-defined? How is the precedence between those operators established? Well, there's actually one universal rule in Scala that the precedence of an operator is determined by its first character. And here's a table of all the characters and the precedence categories. You will note that the table is very similar to precedence in uh, a language such as Java or C, and that's no accident. So the first thing to do is to say, well, the lowest precedence is every operator that starts with a letter. So alphanumeric operators have lowest precedence. Then we take essentially the precedence groups of C and Java. So the next lowest is bar, followed by caret, followed by ampersand, followed by less than, greater than, equals, bang. The colon is inserted. The colon is not in, in Java, so we insert it in here. Then plus, minus, and finally times, slash, and percent. And every character which is not in this list, uh, every symbol character which is not in this list, is assumed to have a higher precedence than everything else. You might say, why these rules and not others? And I don't really have a good answer for that. The only answer is that it's important that everybody uses the same precedence rules because otherwise it's very hard to read other people's code. So that's why Scala has opted for a single rule that determines the precedence of each operator. So as an exercise for this session, I would like you to ask to provide a fully parenthesized version of this string, of this expression here. What I mean by that is that you should be put every binary operation into parentheses in a way such that the structure of the expression doesn't change. So let's see how we would go about that. In this string here, what's the operator with the highest precedence? 
Well, it turns out it's the question mark carrot because question mark was not in our list, yet it's a symbolic character. So those are assumed to have the highest precedence. So we're safe making a pair of parentheses around this one first. The next highest one then would be the plus that we see here. So that gives us here a pair of parents, followed by the equal sign here. So the arrow here would be in parentheses. Of the remaining three, the next highest one would be the caret. Then the bar. And finally, the lowest precedence would be the less. So that's the fully parenthesized version of the string I'm after. Now, this might be a fun exercise, but you see that if you are actually asked to read a string like that, then that's maybe less funny. Of course, it's perfectly fine to define a mathematical operator such as plus or bar for something where this operator makes sense. And in some domains, it's also perfectly fine to define new symbolic operators that have a special fixed meanings in these domains. But please, don't go overboard inventing fancy operating operator names for all the operations in your API. It's usually not appreciated by, the, by your users because they ha will have a hard time understanding that and also will have a hard time setting the parentheses as you see here.